While scientists all over were adhering to the minimal effects hypothesis, a different contrary trend led to a so-called rediscovery of the powerful media paradigm. One important reason for this were the many presumed effects of communication during the Second World War. Not only historians, but sociologists too pointed at the concerted propaganda efforts of both the Allied and Axis forces. Specifically the situation in Nazi Germany that had caused so many to agree with and later not object to Hitler's policies was an important theme for study. This new paradigm that formed, the powerful media we discovered, was slightly more nuanced than the older powerful media paradigm. Scientists had learned from the studies of Lazarsfeld and Hofland and such that direct, immediate and uniform effects were difficult to prove. But ever since the Second World War, there was a growing body of scientific work forming that suggested strong, long-term, indirect and personal effects. New theories on powerful media were more nuanced than the older ones and saw the effects more in terms of reinforcement than actual change. Not only scientists objected to the minimal effect theory. Popular belief in the powerful media paradigm remained strong and only grew after the war. Many people working in the advertisement, political campaigning or in the media industry could not come to terms with the minimal effects thesis and added anecdotal evidence that further supported the idea of a powerful media. The Second World War propaganda had in the popular eye been extremely influential, even though scientists were still arguing this, because it had helped create a huge social support for the war effort. The idea that the media had failed pre-war Germany was also apparent. Why hadn't the fourth estate stopped the rise of Hitler? What was the use of a check on government power if it didn't stop something like this from happening? These and other instances, where media owners misused their powers, led to a commission on freedom of the press to investigate the democratic role of the media. In 1947 they published their report, and it's still the basis for our modern thought today on this. They concluded that, yes, like the fourth estate model, the press is crucial for a healthy political system, because they serve as a platform for opinions of the people, and they serve as a check on government power. However, unlike the fourth estate model, which included that the media should be free of any constrictions, the commission proposed a that in order for the media to serve the people, there should be guidelines that govern media behavior, and b that the basis of these guidelines should be a feeling of social responsibility. This is why this model is called the social responsibility model. And c the commission stated that every political institute needs checks and balances. Therefore, also the media can't be completely without restrictions. There's room for government interference in extreme cases. D, however, it's preferable to avoid extreme measures. Therefore, the media should govern themselves through a system of a professional code of ethics upheld by a self-imposed regulatory body. It is this social responsibility model that is in fact dominant today. Each country has, of course, its own variation, but usually there are some rules that media organizations adhere to. And there is some sort of committee made up of media professionals that um, don't hold any official power, but media organizations agree that this court can fine them uh, and give other sanctions when the professional code is breached. The introduction all over the world of this new system of media governance clearly shows that despite the fact that scientifically the issue was on a debate, the powerful media idea was still widespread. This belief further increased with the rise of television.